During these times there was a pestilence, by which the whole human race came near to being annihilated. Now, in the case of all other scourges sent from heaven, some explanation of a cause might be given by daring men, such as the many theories propounded by those who are clever in these matters. But for this calamity, it is quite impossible either to express in words or to conceive in thought any explanation, except indeed to refer it to God. For it did not come in a part of the world, nor upon certain men, nor did it confine itself to any season of the year, so that from such circumstances it might be possible to find subtle explanations of a cause. But it embraced the entire world, and blighted the lives of all men, though differing from one another in the most marked degree, respecting neither sex nor age. For, much as men differ with regard to places in which they live, or in the law of their daily life, or in natural bent, or in active pursuits, or in whatever else man differs from man, in the case of this disease alone, the difference availed naught. And it attacked some in the summer season, others in the winter, and still others at the other times of the year. Now let each one express his own judgment concerning the matter, both sophist and astrologer. But as for me, I shall proceed to tell where this disease originated and the manner in which it destroyed men. It started from the Egyptians who dwell in Pelusium. Then it divided and moved in one direction towards Alexandria and the rest of Egypt, and in the other direction it came to Palestine on the borders of Egypt, and from there it spread over the whole world, always moving forward and travelling at times favourable to it. For it seemed to move by fixed arrangement, and to tarry for a specified time in each country, casting its blight slightingly upon none, but spreading in either direction right out to the ends of the world, as if fearing lest some corner of the earth might escape it. For it left neither island, nor cave, nor mountain ridge which had human inhabitants, and if it passed by any land, either not affecting the men there or touching them in indifferent fashion, still, at a later time, it came back. Then those who dwelt round about this land, whom formerly it had affected most sorely, it did not touch at all, but it did not remove from the place in question until it had given up its just and proper tale of dead, so as to correspond exactly to the number destroyed at the earlier time among those who dwelt round about. And this disease always took its start from the coast, and from there went up to the interior. And in the second year it reached Byzantium in the middle of spring, where it happened that I was staying at the time. And it came as follows. Apparitions of supernatural beings in human guise of every description were seen by many persons, and those who encountered them thought that they were struck by the man they had met in this or that part of the body, as it havened, and immediately upon seeing this apparition, they were seized also by the disease. Now, at first, those who saw the creatures tried to turn them aside by uttering the holiest of names and exorcising them in other ways, as well as each one could. But they accomplished absolutely nothing, for even in the sanctuaries where the most of them fled for refuge, they were dying constantly. But later on, they were unwilling even to give heed to their friends when they called to them, and they shut themselves up in their rooms and pretended that they did not hear, although their doors were being beaten down, fearing, obviously, that he who was calling was one of those demons. But in the case of some of the pestilence did not come on in this way, but they saw a vision in a dream, and seemed to suffer the very same thing at the hands of the creature who stood over them, 
or else to hear a voice foretelling to them that they were written down in the number of those who would die. But with the majority, it came about that they were seized by the disease without becoming aware of what was coming, either through a, a waking vision or a dream, and they were taken in the following manner. They had a sudden fever. Some, when just roused from sleep, others while walking about, and others while otherwise engaged, without any regard to what they were doing. And the body showed no change from its previous colour, nor was it hot, as might be expected when attacked by a fever, nor indeed did any inflammation set in. But the fever was of such a languid sort from its commencement, and up till evening, that neither to the sick themselves, nor to a physician who touched them, would it afford any suspicion of danger. It was natural, therefore, that not one of those who had contracted the disease expected to die from it. But on the same day, in some cases, in others on the following day, and in the rest, not so many days later, a bubonic swelling developed. And this took place not only in the particular part of the body which is called bubon, that is, below the abdomen, but also inside the armpit, and in some cases also beside the ears, and at different points on the thighs. Up to this point, then, everything went in about the same way with all who had taken the disease. But from then on, very marked differences developed, and I am unable to say whether the cause of this diversity of symptoms was to be found in the differences in bodies, or in the fact that it followed the wish of him who brought the disease into the world. For there ensued with some a, a deep coma, with others a violent delirium, in either case they suffered the characteristic symptoms of the disease. For those who were under the spell of the coma forgot all those who were familiar to them, and seemed to lie sleeping constantly. And if anyone cared for them, they would eat without waking, but some also were neglected, and these would die directly through lack of sustenance. But those who were seized with delirium suffered from insomnia and were victims of a distorted imagination, for they suspected that men were coming upon them to destroy them, and they would become excited and rush off in a flight, crying out at the top of their voices. And when water chanced to be near, they wished to fall into it, not so much because of a desire for drink, for the most of them rushed into the sea, but the cause was to be found chiefly in the diseased state of their minds. And in those cases where neither coma nor delirium came on, the bubonic swelling became mortified, and the sufferer, no longer able to endure the pain, died. And one would suppose that in all cases the same thing would have been true, but since they were not at all in their senses, some were quite unable to feel the pain, for owing to the troubled condition of their minds, they lost all sense of feeling. Now, the disease in Byzantium ran a course of four months, and its greatest virulence lasted about three, and at first the deaths were a little more than the normal, then the mortality rose still higher, and afterwards the tale of dead reached five thousand each day, and again it came to ten thousand and still more than that. Now in the beginning, each man attended to the burial of the dead of his own house, and these they threw even into the tombs of others, either escaping detection or using violence. But afterwards, confusion and disorder everywhere became complete. For slaves remained destitute of masters, and men who in former times were very prosperous were deprived of the service of their domestics, who were either sick or dead, and many houses became completely destitute of human inhabitants. For this reason, it came about that some of the notable men of the city, because of the universal destitution, remained unburied for many days. And it fell to the lot of the emperor, as was natural, to make provision for the trouble. He therefore detailed soldiers from the palace and distributed money, commanding Theodorus to take charge of this work. This man held the position of announcer of imperial messages, always announcing to the emperor the petitions of his clients and declaring to them in turn whatever his wish was. 
In the Latin tongue, the Romans designate this office by the term referendarius. So those who had not as yet fallen into complete destitution in their domestic affairs attended individually to the burial of those connected with them. But Theodorus, by giving out the emperor's money and by making further expenditures from his own purse, kept burying the bodies which were not cared for. And when it came about that all the tombs which had existed previously were filled with the dead, then they dug up all the places about the city, one after the other, laid the dead there, each one as he could, and departed. But later on those who were making the trenches no longer able to keep up with the number of the dying mounted the towers of the fortifications in Psyche, and tearing off the roofs threw the bodies there in complete disorder, and they piled them up just as each one happened to fall, and filled practically all the towers with corpses, and then covered them up again with their roofs. As a result of this, an evil stench pervaded the city, and distressed the inhabitants still more, and especially whenever the wind blew fresh from that quarter.